So, good afternoon. It's after lunch. I hope everybody's awake. <laughs> um, this is, uh, the title of this is actually taken from uh, some of what we saw when this conference was announced. Um, and it fit in very nicely with work that um, we have been doing on the clothing industry in uh, various African countries. Just to give you a little bit of background, um, the, the work that we've been doing had uh, um, the motivation that, first of all, we had been doing work on clothing for quite a number of years uh, in the Institute for Development Studies. We started a African clothing and footwear research network back in 2001, which consists of researchers initially from four countries, uh, which was subsequently expanded to six. Um, and this particular project, which is funded by IDRC, uh, came out of that network. It came out of work that we had been doing. And we were, the concern that we, that motivated it was that uh, with the end of the MFA in 2005, uh, China and the rise of China as a major producer of clothing, uh, we were faced with the question of would the African clothing industry survive? And we looked at some uh, data which suggested that it, as we were preparing the proposal in 2009-10, that in fact um, the African clothing industry was surviving, not at a high level, but it was surviving. But we also saw some significant differences. And so, now let me see if I can do this, technology. Um, we, we saw that it was surviving at different levels. So the, uh, this presentation is suggesting that initially, if we talk about breaking in and staying in, um, the Africa's post-MFA experience of global apparel trade is that, yes, Africa broke in. And it broke in uh, a lot as a result of AGOA, and also the MFA, which allowed foreign investment to come in and use uh, African countries as a platform for exporting uh, to uh, mainly the US, but also the European Union uh, in the time of quotas. So once those quotas were removed, the question was, well, what would happen? And there were those who were predicting that it would collapse and those who were uh, saying, well, maybe it would go on. So we wanted to look at that. And this was what we looked at. Now, when we were doing the original, of course, we were here in 2009, 2010. So we didn't see this upturn that has come since then. But we looked and we saw that, yes, there had been decline in a number of the countries. Um, Mauritius, being the biggest exporter, had also experienced decline. Madagascar had experienced a very steep decline. Um, Lesotho, more gradual. Kenya, more gradual. And then Swaziland down here, um, looking a little bit the same way. So what it would account for the differences? The, the factors that we had talked about were, in fact, factors for everyone. Uh, China and the MFA, <laughs> and quota removal and so on, that was common, and yet their experiences were different. So what would account for that difference? And we looked at various theories, uh, trade theory, global value chains, institutional approaches, and we came up with five possible explanations for the differences. Not mutually exclusive, but we didn't know really which ones would be the ones that would be most important. So we said, yes, maybe some of the countries had more favorable industrialization and trade policies than others. Uh, maybe some had better local resources than others. We knew, for example, that Mauritius had fabric. Uh, they had fabric mills, and some of the other countries were importing all their fabric. Maybe that was something that made a difference. Um, we saw differences in market destinations. Some were exporting totally to the US. Others were favoring the European Union. 
uh, some had a mix. Uh, maybe it was differences in their industrial and uh, product specialization. Some countries were very heavily into the clothing industry, while others had a, a more diversified base of exports and where uh, apparel exports were not so important to them. And likewise with products. <clears throat> Some were doing basics, uh, t-shirts and jeans. And others were trying to move into different niches. Did that make a difference? And then, of course, um, theory would always suggest if some firms or some countries were more innovative, that they might be the, the more successful ones. So we set out to investigate uh, empirically all of these. Um, the methodology, we collected primary data. Uh, we have, as our network, we're based in different countries. So we had a methodology workshop together and then the researchers went out to investigate in their own countries. Um, I had the privilege as the leader of the thing to visit all of the countries and to visit factories in every one of the countries that we did. We, we were in seven countries, but this analysis concentrates on the five main exporters. We eliminated uh, from this analysis Ethiopia because when we saw that those graphs, Ethiopia was way down and only came up at the, in the very end of the time period. And so we didn't think that it was quite fair to put Ethiopia into this analysis. And Tanzania had very little in the way of clothing exports. Um, we ended up doing some case studies of firms, but not uh, including them in this analysis. Uh, the unit of analysis was the firm. We collected. Uh, data using a structured survey, but we also did qualitative work. We did some selected case studies and we did a number of key informant interviews. And the data analysis was quantitative at the firm level, qualitative on the case studies. And we also had, um, as part of our work, uh, downloaded Comtrade data <clears throat> and that was what was used, uh, for example, to generate the graphs that I showed you a couple of minutes ago. So that was a good benchmark because, of course, the firms that we selected uh, may not have given us a total picture of the exports of a country, but the Comtrade data was much more complete. Oops. Um, all right, in looking at the countries, we, we looked at firm size, we looked at the uh, firm establishment and ownership, we looked at uh, country and product specialization, we looked at markets and competitors, and we looked at local resources. Um, you can see the um, ownership, uh, excuse me, the employment size varied considerably uh, from firms that were, I think I, no, I didn't do it, I, where we left off, then this is our uh, various sizes. Um, the smallest firm in the sample was quite small. Uh, it was in Kenya and it had 23 uh, employees. The largest had 6,200. So we had quite a range of sizes, but you can see that the, uh, the concentration there um, is it, between 500 and 3,000, if you look at the numbers across. Um, and the, with the 1,000 to, to 3,000 being um, a good number there, but then also we had quite a number in the 100 to 500 range, 100 to 499. So the employment sizes uh, were quite varied, um, and you can uh, see. Also interesting was the period of firm establishment. Um, some of the uh, countries, like Mauritius, for example, most of their firms were founded before 2001, before AGOA. Uh, whereas, uh, and Madagascar also had a, a significant proportion of older firms. Whereas uh, in some of the other countries, like Kenya, Lesotho, uh, the firm establishment tended to be post-AGOA, um, the, the brown lines being uh, from 2001 to 2004. And then uh, from, interestingly, there are also firms from post-2005, after the MFA, 
ended. We had some firms, apparel firms, being begun. So we thought that that was actually rather uh, significant. Whoops. Um, the ownership, overall distribution across all of the countries, uh, foreign-owned firms were 62%. Uh, some joint ownership, foreign, local, 10% uh, and local owner, ownership, 28%. Uh, but local ownership varies considerably across countries, with Mauritius being 85% locally owned, whereas uh, Lesotho at the other end was 5% locally owned, 95% foreign owned. And as we will see, that makes a difference. Um, industrial specialization. Um, our, our data here, we didn't collect firm data for this because this is by country. Uh, so we relied on information in the reports of the researchers out there. And they gave us different um, kinds of information. But we range from Lesotho, which is heavily uh, in the clothing industry, and 70% of their manufacturing employment, and 90% of uh, total employment is in the clothing industry. Um, Mauritius, uh, less but still very significant, Madagascar, uh, Swaziland, and Kenya. Kenya considers uh, the clothing sector to be important, and it's in Vision 2030 as an important industry, but it only accounts for 9.6% of manufacturing employment. So it's a much less, uh, Kenya is much less reliant on this industry than some of the other countries. Um, basics, the basics of t-shirts and jeans and, and such uh, like uh, products. We ask people, uh, firms, how, what proportion of your uh, production is basics, what would you consider to be differentiated products, and what would you consider to be fairly complicated products. And basics for most was the majority, uh, ranging from almost 72% in Swaziland down to 29% in Madagascar, which is a very interesting uh, phenomenon in Madagascar, that they tend to do much more differentiated products, even though um, they are uh, one of the, in, in general, one of the poorer countries, but their text, their clothing industry is at a higher level than some of the others. Um, even Mauritius uh, has 58% of its production in basics. Um, market orientation, we looked at, we tried to categorize countries according to whether they were US dominant, EU dominant, uh, Africa dominant or diversified. And we did that based on what they told us about their markets for different products and how much went to um, each of the different products, uh, each of the different locations. So for Kenya, Kenya is clearly US dominant and a bit, some of the firms are Africa dominant. Some of the firms that in our sample were exporting mainly to the region. Um, and then they had, I think this is only one firm that one could say was really diversified. They spread across. Um, Lesotho was likewise US dominant. Whereas when you get to Madagascar, the US is much less, partly because they were disqualified from AGOA. Um, and then the EU is higher, and they have a bit more, one or two firms that are either Africa dominant or uh, diversified. Mauritius is much more in the EU. Swaziland, we're back to a US dominant, but, but they're kind of almost evenly spread with US, Africa, and diversified. So market destinations are quite different. Uh, their competitors, China is a competitor in all markets. We asked them about their, their domestic market, their regional markets, um, their US markets and their EU markets. Who did they consider to be their main competitors? And we found that in all markets, China was a competitor. Now, very interestingly, across these five countries, in all markets, Mauritius was also a competitor, um, as was Bangladesh, and then a sort of lump category of uh, all African countries, other African countries. 
India was a competitor in export markets, but not in the domestic market. Um, Asia, other Asian countries, which included Vietnam, Cambodia, etc., were uh, competitors in uh, export markets. And other countries, there were a few other countries named, like Turkey, uh, and they were competitors in their export to EU or US. All right, local resources. There were problems. Did they have local resources? They were problems of lack of local fabric almost everywhere. Um, but they seem to be able, because AGOA allows, uh, those with the US market were able to import fabric. Um, then labor, some of you may have heard Paul Kamau's uh, paper yesterday in which we talk about the serious shortage of high-level technical skills, that a very high proportion of the technical workers in all of these firms tend to be expatriates, which means that at the technical level, the, the, um, the skills and the, the production may not be sustainable in the long run. All right, what, how, what about continuing to export? What, what uh, is actually happening? We, we divide, we're able to divide the five countries, and we saw that two, Mauritius and Kenya, Mauritius and Kenya, seem to be stabilizing. Lesotho was a bit unclear. And we, we looked at this in light of where were they in 2010, because that's when we were cutting off here. Uh, where were they in 2010 compared to where they were in 2005? So were they, they may have gone up and down, but where were they relative to, uh, to 2005? No, excuse me, we didn't cut off. We went to 2011 here. So Mauritius and Kenya seem to be stabilizing. Lesotho was a bit unclear. It was below where it was in 2005, but it was a bit on an upward trend. The ones that were having real difficulty were uh, Madagascar and Swaziland. So when we looked at those countries in that way, then what did we see about these issues? What were the factors? that seemed to enable those who were continuing, who were stabilizing and doing a bit better, what were the factors in enabling them to continue to export? Now, in the paper itself, when you see the paper, I have quite a complicated table that shows you each of the countries and each of the factors in great detail. But I knew that for this presentation, um, that wouldn't be very feasible. I'd be here for another 20 minutes. So just to name the factors, uh, the, the, one of the main factors was political stability, which both Madagascar and Swaziland have lacked. Madagascar has had its continuing troubles, um, and it's still in the newspapers with its political problems. Swaziland is more like a low-level problem. Um, yes, they have a king, and yes, the regime is, is in place, but there's always simmering discontent. Uh, so we put it in, in that realm that uh, for both Madagascar and Swaziland, they seem to lack political stability, and that was contributing to their uh, situation of lack of stability in the industry. Um, the issue of local ownership. Mauritius, which is the highest um, producer in the area and seems to be holding its own the best, has the highest level of local ownership. Um, and um, Kenya has a fair uh, amount of local ownership as well, either local or joint ownership. Um, and that seems to contribute to uh, a local embeddedness of the industry and to a, a possibility of continuing. Then the issue of industry support structures. OK, I'll try to wind up. Um, 
we looked at not just policy. Policy was what we thought was going to make a difference. But in fact, what made more of a difference was how that policy was implemented. Were there practical practices on the ground where, for example, export Mauritius that helps the exporters to uh, make contacts, et cetera. So industry support structures were important, as were human resources, these technical skills. So what are our conclusions from this? We didn't see spectacular differences. We saw that African clothing industry is what one of our resource people sa uh, said, jogging along. It needs to do more than that. It's depending on trade preferences, on expatriate skills, and on imported fabric. And that's not really the way to build a sustainable industry. Some countries are doing better than others. But all of them need help in reducing costs, in diversifying markets, in investing in better skills, uh, and local raw materials, and new technologies. So the industry is jogging along. It's managing. But for it to really be any kind of an engine of growth, of course, it needs to do more than that. We owe thanks to many people, and we thank you for listening.